Good evening. My name is Dr. David Delman, and welcome to another edition of House Call. Are you curious about heart health? Find out more right now. My guest this evening is Dr. Mark Milner, a noted cardiologist practicing right here in Montgomery County. Dr. Milner, welcome to House Call. Thank you, Dave. Briefly tell our viewers about your professional background. Uh, I'm a presently a physician at Johns Hopkins, practicing in the Bethesda area, uh, with previous academic experience at Washington Hospital Center, George Washington, and Georgetown. I've always had a very strong interest in cardiac prevention. I've been heavily involved with cardiac rehab. And as far back as the late 1980s, I was in a physician panel, which would go from restaurant to restaurant to review if they provided a heart healthy menu. And if they did, we gave them a Washington Hospital heart sticker and they were able to put it in their window and on their menus. So heart prevention has always been, a, has always been very strong in my heart. So before we focus on the topic at hand, heart health, Tell our viewers by way of uh, uh, introduction, what exactly are the risk factors for heart disease? Well, there are multiple risk factors. The question is what risk factors are important and which you can prevent. You cannot pre prevent your genetics. You are what your parents gave you and you have to live with that. The key is what you can prevent. And the major risk factors by far and away is smoking and diabetes. Those tend to cause heart disease in younger people. And then after that, in the, as you get older, hypertension, hyperlipidemia play major roles. And of course, obesity and, and diabetes adds to that. So of course, some of those things you mentioned, whether it's diabetes, uh, whether it's high cholesterol, et cetera, smoking, some of these things we can control. And that will be the theme of tonight's uh, interview, heart health. So it, uh, given uh, you mentioned genetics, how important is genetics in coronary artery disease? Well, genetics is important in, in all disease. Not everybody from who is lived in Hiroshima developed, developed thyroid cancer. Not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. Not every coal miner gets lung disease. And not everybody in Love Canal gets uh, leukemia. But the fact is, before 1900, heart disease was a rare disorder. In Germany, they did autopsies on everybody who died in certain cities. And they describe it as a very rare and interesting finding among the affluent, primarily royalty. Dr. Sir William Osler, who's considered the greatest physician of the 20th century, he's considered the god of medicine. He wrote the original textbook of medicine for the 20th century. In his first edition in 1892, he said it is a rare disorder. He had not seen one heart attack in his first 10 years in private practice. And in Hopkins, in his first uh, three, he, he only saw three cases in his first three years at Hopkins. He then talks about Edinburgh, which is the was considered the greatest hospital in the world at that time, and they had only five case reports in two years of 9,000 patients admitted. So prior to the turn of the century, heart disease was not a significant problem. It was a minuscule problem, and uh, now it is the number one problem in healthcare. Uh, so it clearly is environmentally infected, but there's genetics that plays a role in anything. There is one genetic disease that does cause heart disease and early disease. It's homozygote familial hyperlipidemia, where their LDL cholesterols are over 500, sometimes 1,000. Those people all die in their 20s and 30s of a heart attack unless they get special procedures like plasmapheresis to remove the lipids from their bloodstream. But they're one in a million, so it is not a major, it's a very minor, but when you have it, you're in serious trouble. Let's go on then to discuss diet, and there's so many aspects of this we'll cover tonight. Share with our viewers what you consider to be empty calories. Well, empty calories are essentially calories that have no other value except for the sugar content. And these are your sugar-sweetened drinks, your sugar-sweetened fruit juices, where it says contains 10% fruit juice, which means it contains 90% sugar water. Uh, they are actually in our teenage population account for about 20% of their calories, which is a dramatic amount of your one-fifth of your calories is just from drinking soda. 
Uh, and for every soda drink you drink, there's a 1.6 fold increase in risk for developing heart disease. We've had a 500% increase in the past 40 years in the amount of soda consumption, and it's become a big business. If you go to any school, you'll see in the cafeteria a line of soda machines, and the students are buying sodas like crazy. And when we when they did that, the giant down the street, which you can see from Walter Johnson's windows, on their back wall, put three soda machines outside that the students can see from their classroom that you can't see if you're going in the giant. It's in the back wall just to get the students to walk over to get their sodas. So soda is a big problem. You know, the Gulf, the unlimited soda at the McDonald's and Burger King, it's, it's a major, major issue. And it has no beneficial purpose whatsoever. Well, Mark, going then to um, uh, the sodas you mentioned, other people like to try to watch their calories by using artificial sweeteners. What are your thoughts about those in terms of safety? Well, as you know, there's a huge dramatic increase of artificial sweeteners. Uh, people feel if they have no calories in their beverages, they will lose weight. There's never been one study showing that artificial sweeteners cause weight loss. In fact, they cause weight gain. Uh, there's a parallel, parallel rise in diabetes with artificial sweeteners, uh, a just you're 67% more likely to get diabetes. The problem is when you drink artificial sweeteners, you get a sweet taste in your mouth and you have sweet taste buds. And then you develop a craving for these objects. When you don't eat any carbs or sugars, or artificial ten sweeteners, you lose these sweet taste buds and then anything that's sweet will taste poorly to you. If you give someone apple pie from the 1800s, Made today, they would say, oh, it's too sweet. I can't eat it because it's too, too much sugar in it. If you gave yourself apple pie from 1800s, you wouldn't eat it because it's too bitter because the apple is the only sweetening agent in it. So we became made our food products so sweet that we developed urges for sweet foods. In fact, artificial sweeteners are much preferred by animals than regular sugar. If you have a, if you have a rat in an experimental model and you give him the choice of an artificial sweetener or sugar, he'll take the artificial sweetener. If you give him a choice of artificial sweetener and cocaine, he'll pick the artificial sweetener. Uh -huh. And it's interesting, when you eat artificial sweeteners in this animal model, you should have a slide there, if you give the mouse the artificial sweeteners, his gut flora will change and he will metabolize sugar in a more rapid fashion to make him more hyperglycemic and more tending towards a diabetic profile. So artificial sweeteners, if anything, promote diabetes. They have no proven benefit, but people take it because they feel they're taking less calories, which they are, as opposed to regular sweeteners. But the best thing is to have just, you know, water or bubbled water or water with a little lime or lemon juice. In it. There's a sense out in the community that not all artificial sweeteners are the same. And in particular, that one of the newer agents, Splenda, may be safer than a sweet, low, and equal. What do you say to that? Well, this, the same problem exists. The point is if you eat sweet products, you're gonna want carbs. You're gonna carb crave. So your taste buds will taste the sweetness of it because you can tell it's sweet and then you'll have more growth of more sugar-related taste buds and you'll want more sugar or carb-related items. And you'll have those urges. The only way, and this is what Atkins showed, Atkins was brilliant. If you stay away from any carbs for two weeks, you will lose these taste buds, and then you'll have the, you'll have much less craving for carbs. It's it's an it's an environmental created behavior. If you gave artificial sweetness to someone from the 1800s, they would hate it. If you gave artificial sweetness from the 1950s, someone they would hate because they never tasted it before. And they'd be too sweet. And the general recommendation. You know, you know, one little saccharin tablet is equal to two large tablespoons of sugar. The general recommendation is that it's better to have a half a teaspoon of sugar than to have artificial sweetness because it's not that sweet, just a little sweet to get you over the top and you won't get addicted to sweetness. I mean, these are dangerous in the sense they change your whole dietary habits. Let's shift gears to discuss trans fatty acids, which seem to go in and out of vogue. Uh, share with the viewers the latest thoughts about that. Well, trans fatty acids are essentially man-made products. You take regular vegetable oil and you heat it up, and they go from cis to trans, and they become partially hydrogenated is another way of calling them, partially hydrogenated fats or trans fatty acids. They became very popular for the simple reason that they're much more stable. When I was at pre-air air conditioning 
days, if you went into a candy store, chocolate bars were put on the on the floor level because it was cooler and they put in the shade. Because you bought a chocolate bar, you put it in your pocket, next thing you know, you have a melted chocolate bar. And that's the reason M&Ms were invented in World War II. They were a World War II creation because it melts in your mouth, not in your hand. When you have trans fatty acids, you have a much more stable product. It's easier to eat with your hands. It's easier to use. It doesn't spoil. It's a much more stable chemical compound. But unfortunately, it is the most provoking element for heart disease. In general rule of thumb, if you if you drop your 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 uh, your your cholesterol levels one percent, you'll have a two percent drop in cardiac events. But if you increase your trans fatty acids by just two percent you get a 20 to 25% incidence of heart disease. They are the number one provoker of heart disease. Uh, and it's such a small component of our diet. It's a very small, it's 2% of our diet, but it's the most dangerous part of our diet. So economically for the food industry, it's the greatest product in the world, but if for your heart industry, it's not. Give examples of, of, of potential um, food items that would be high in trans fatty acids. Well. It's it, it, if you look at the ingredient labels of any package, it lists right underneath the saturated fats the amount of trans fatty acids. And uh, essentially, anything that's made by men will have anything that's natural. Very few natural substances have trans fatty acids. There's uh, one in, in cows, and it's uh, we'll talk about that later, but it's a very safe trans fatty acid, it's a unique one. But in general, most of our food products do not have it. It is a man-made issue. So just anything made by man. And so if you go to McDonald's, the first morning French fries will have the least trans fatty acids because it came out of the vegetable uh, bottle. By the end of the day, it'll be much higher in trans fatty acids because it's been used all day for cooking. So the key is to avoid man-made products. If you avoid them, you avoided these partially hydrogenated fatty acids. You mentioned earlier reading ingredient, ingredient labels um, of food packages. How reliable are they? Uh, they're extremely reliable, but it, there's a, a, an aspect to that. First, I'd like to thank Michelle Obama because she pushed it. And as of January 2006, all our food labels have to list underneath saturated fats the amount of trans fatty acids. And the problem is the food industry is very strong. And they said, if it's less than 500 milligrams, you can write zero. And the point is two grams is more than we're supposed to have. So if one cookie has 490 milligrams and it says that one serving is one cookie, then essentially four, five cookies will exceed your daily allowance. So if it says zero, it does not imply it's zero unless we change requirements, but we have not been able to change requirements for 14 years. It's still zero is equal to less than 500 milligrams. It is not zero. But I, in other countries, in Denmark, zero is zero. It's been eliminated. There are no partially hydrogenated fat vegetable oils. And actually, their economy is booming because of it, because they won't import any products that have it. So they, have, they are an exporter of food. Mark, we have 30 seconds. Very quickly, are eggs good or bad for you? Eggs is the, is the greatest little package of protein and, and food that you'll ever find. Uh, eggs uh, was brought over to, from Columbus to America. We did not have domesticated fowl in Europe. So there were no eggs on a regular diet until after 1500. So inexpensive, cheap, very super source of protein. Its only problem is the company they keep. We tend to ha have eggs in our cookies, our breads, our cake. It's the glue of food. So we 50, over 50% of our eggs are the products that are bad for you. But in Japan, they eat eggs the way they are, hard-boiled eggs on the side of their meals, and they have much lower incidence of heart disease. In one study where they gave volunteers three eggs a day for 12 weeks, their LDL, HDL profile improved. There's no data eggs are bad for you as they are, hard-boiled eggs, uh, but unfortunately, the company they keep, it, it's not. And if, if you're a fan of Kuhl and Luke, Paul Newman did quite well eating 50 eggs in one hour there. <laughs> We're going to pause briefly for a public service announcement. More with cardiologist Dr. Mark Milner in a moment. We'll be right back. Practicing meditation, mindfulness, or other spiritual practices can help ground you. For more tips, visit coping-19.org. We're back, and my guest this evening is Dr. Mark Milner, and we are discussing heart health. 
Mark, let's go on to discuss uh, the effects of modernization on the risk of developing heart disease. Why is it that uh, compared to 100 years ago, we are having an escalating risk of developing vascular issues? Well, modernization has led to convenience. And essentially, before 1900, there very little sugars around. I mean, the sugar industry is the biggest industry of the 1600s. It's probably responsible for slavery in America more than tobacco. And people crave sugars. And the problem is, before 1900, it was hard to get. So mostly you had used honey and other sweeteners that were much safer for you. With the boom of the sugar industry at World War I, the number one present for your fiance was false teeth because everybody was giving cavities and we didn't have to know how to fill cavities. We would just pull the teeth out. So dentures were very common in World War I. And that was our sugar industry. Then our cigarettes. People smoked for hundreds of years. But the fact is, before World War II, you had to roll your own cigarette. You had to take the tobacco out of the pouch, take a cigarette paper, and before 1900, you had to make your own cigarette paper. They didn't sell cigarette paper. So you had to roll it, took a time. And now in 1960s, you always see on these TV shows, you smoke a cigarette before it's over. You take another cigarette and light it right off of it. I mean, you could smoke a pack in a half hour. But if you had to do it the old-fashioned way, it takes time. And time means you're less likely to do it. The biggest invention in the 1930s was Taggart creating Wonder Bread. What did Wonder Bread do? Before, 19, before Wonder Bread, if you wanted a sandwich, your mother would have, or whoever in the house was would bake a loaf of bread and you'd have to cut it up and slice it and make a sandwich and that loaf of bread would spoil by the next day. So you had to eat it for that day. So you would rarely have baked bread. It was an inconvenience. But now you have Wonder Bread. What was, wonder, what was the wonder about it? It didn't turn hard. For 10 days, it would stay soft. You can make a sandwich, you just put it in your bread box. Two slices, you got a sandwich in 10 seconds. And so that's Wonder Bread. And then what happened with Edison? He created the refrigerator. What with the refrigerator and the icebox, now foods that we would normally never eat because they would spoil, we could buy and eat and keep in our refrigerator. So all our greasy, fatty products that would normally spoil, we keep in the refrigerator. But before that, the only foods that would last through the winter in the 1800s was a sack of potatoes in, the, in your basement. So the point is that your natural carbs don't spoil, but the man-made things do spoil. So our modernization result to cut bread, refrigerators, and you know, smoking more convenient and sugar is more convenient. What exactly is a poly pill? Well, uh, a poly pill, that's, I mean, I, I, uh, I, this has been in the papers like crazy. Uh, the fact is a poly pill is a combination of, some have aspirin, some don't, but it's an aspirin, a statin, and one to three blood pressure pills. The latest study was at TIPS3, which showed a drop in heart disease risk from 1.8 to 1.3%. They took people who have high risk for heart disease, mainly having multiple risk factors, but not having documented heart disease, and the poly pill helped prevent it. So there's a role for a poly pill, but to be honest, there's a role for treating people who have risk factors. But the key is why treat people with risk factors? Why not just prevent them from having risk factors? You know, before World War II, if you look at an aircraft carrier during World War II, all the 20-year-old soldiers on the, on, the, on the deck of the boat are topless, and they're all wearing 29-inch waist. Everybody had the same waist. We didn't have carbs, so everybody was skinny. There was no obesity. There was no adult-onset diabetes. It was just much less common. And the fact is, instead of treating people with abusive behavior, change the behavior as a child so that you eat healthy, exercise regularly, and then you won't need a polypill. But Yes, the fact is if you have risk factors, you should be on therapies to lower them, and that's what the poly pill does. They want to make it as an over-counter possible uh, adjunct to as a vitamin for patients, essentially. Why has diabetes become such an epidemic issue? Well, because, uh, because of modernization. When, when I was a kid, the average football lineman in, in the NFL weighed 225 to 250 pounds. Now there is not one lineman on the offensive line of any football team that's under 300 pounds. Many are up to 350, and the Jets have one guy who's, who's a defensive line, an uh, offensive line who's 370. I mean, these people are huge. This is not genetics. This is one to two generations. You're taller than your parents. Your parents are taller than their parents. This is all environmental changes. In the Civil War, the average soldier was 5'2 to 5'4 inches. We call them shorty today, but that's what the average height is. The classic picture of an immigrant in all our, uh, eight, you know, during uh, 1800s, 1900s is a short, fat person. Why? Because the immigrant had a poor diet, came to the country short because he never got to grow fully, but then he got all the carbs and got fat. 
So the fact is uh, we've changed our environment and become, we've outlived our pancreas. Our pancreas makes insulin to meet our needs. The fact is obese people with diabetes make more insulin than skinny people. The only thing is they don't make enough insulin to meet their needs. So essentially we have an engine that makes a certain amount of genetic insulin for our needs as if we were cavemen, but unfortunately we're now fat men. So the key is uh, diabetes has exploded. Now there is type one diabetes, which is due to a virus. When you're young, your insulin cells that make insulin get destroyed and you make zero insulin. But in adult onset diabetes, you make insulin, you just don't make enough to meet your needs. And it's a, a disease created by our environment. One of the popular things now being presented in um, fast food restaurants is vegetarian burgers and the Impossible Burger. What do you think? What are your thoughts about that? Well, the data on the Impossible Burger is not fully out yet, but I suspect there may be a benefit because it actually is a semi-natural product. It's made by a plant, and therefore it's going to have plant-based items, so it won't have trans fatty acids and saturated fats. So yes, there's some. I suspect they may show major benefit. They have a huge salt content, much higher than anything else. I don't know why, but they do. Uh, but prior to that, the original veggie burgers, when I grew up, they were the worst things in the world. I mean, I, st I still remember, not they were, not all of them, but one fast food chain had the ingredients on the menu. And for the veggie burger, it was 943 calories and 52 grams of fat. And that, that that's a lot for a, a, a veggie burger. So I suspect these will improve. The problem is the food industry works to make you a product that you prefer to eat and taste. And they're not, their major concern is not whether you don't get a heart attack 10 years down the road. So the key is organizations like the FDA and the World Health checking on the effects of these items, how they change you, whether they make you lose weight, whether they improve your lipids. And that's really done by scientific organizations like the World Health and the FDA and not by the food industry. And the commercialism may ruin the benefit of these products. What are your thoughts about fish oil supplements? Well, the beauty of fish is that uh, people who eat fish live longer. The classic Japanese study, where you look at Japanese in Japan versus Japanese immigrating to San Francisco versus Japanese immigrating to New York, the further you go east to west, the higher incidence of heart disease because your diet changes from a Japanese to an American diet. Uh, Greenland Eskimos live, since when I was young, they lived off whale blubber. Now they actually live off bacon, unfortunately. And they lived mm -hmm. off whale blubber. That was 90% of their calories because it gets stored. It wouldn't spoil. It was fine to use and you can eat when you want. But, and their cholesterol was the same as Americans. At that time, both Americans and Eskimos were about 220, 200 to 220. Uh, and yet they had a much lower incidence of heart disease because it's not the cholesterol. The fish oils have omega-3 fatty acids and your cell membranes are compo component covered with fatty acids. And omega-6 are from animal products, omega-3 are from fish oil products. So the more fish you have, the more omega-3 fatty acids you are. And that makes you less inflammatory and there's a lot less incidence of heart disease, stroke, and all your inflammatory disease. Eskimos did not get asthma. They did not have multiple sclerosis. They did not get any of the inflammatory diseases, uh, hyperthyroid, lupus, psoriasis. They just don't get those things. There is one negative to it. Fish does, because it cuts back your inflammatory response, it does prevent you from fighting infections. Infections is how man used to die thousands of years ago, now excluding COVID. We tend not to die that. We tend to die of, you know, heart attack or stroke or cancer. So Eskimos do have a much higher incidence. Well, they did in those days when they were eating fish oil of uh, tuberculosis, and they have higher incidence of bleeding, cerebral bleeding, because they have less of the factors that go with the other omega six fatty acids. No, when I, I, my recommendation is not to take fish oil supplements; just to eat fish. You sure. have to have a source of protein, and fish is the most natural. Why just eat out the squeezed out oil of a sardine when you can eat a sardine? So you mentioned the benefits of, of eating fish. Does that include also seafood? Well, all seafood, well, except not all seafood. I apologize. Um, if you feed fish grain, they will make omega-6 fatty acids. A catfish, when anybody eats a catfish, they'll say it tastes like meat because it is sort of like meat. It's all omega-6s because catfish are homegrown and we feed them grains. We grow them in our ponds and we throw grain and then they eat the grain. 
But fish who eat fish, and the smaller the fish, the more likely it's a pure omega-3. Of course, the omega-3 comes from the plankton. It comes from plants that don't use soil, plankton, anything that grows on water. So little fish eat the plankton, they're pure omega-3s. Bigger fish eat the little fish, but they eat other things. So the bigger the fish, the less omega-3. So the highest is your sardines, your pill shards, your very small fish. Uh, so shellfish have less than the little fish, but I think shellfish are perfectly fine. Shellfish, though they're high in cholesterol, have no saturated fats. I think they're very healthy. It's again, the company you keep, what do most people do with a lobster? They dip it in butter sauce. So if you don't dip it in butter sauce or tartar sauce, enjoy your shellfish. Let's go on to discuss um, athletes. Do you think athletes have a lower risk of heart disease long-term? Absolutely not, but I think that will change because of the unions. Uh, the average athlete 20, 30 years ago, you know, you, you take a person out of high school, who's a super coordinated person. They say, you're going to be on the football team. We're going to have you gain 50 pounds. We feed you 10,000 calories a day. You work out four hours a day, you become a muscle man. You're, you got 4% body fat. You look terrific and you're the fastest human on earth. And then what happens? Your knee goes out, you get older and then you stop exercising, but you still are in a habit of having 10,000 calories a day. So you develop marked obesity and ex-athletes were morbidly obese. Now with the unions, they now are every athlete who's on a professional football team, but not a college athlete, will get counseling for the rest of their life on diet and exercise. So we're seeing a lot more athletes that are slimmer and better shaped than the old days. But athletes developed heart disease much earlier because of the way they were fed and the way they were trained. They were trained to be an, a machine and not to be a healthy human being. Now, exercise is great. And those who raise that as an environmental part of their nature those whose parents said, let's go hiking every day. Let's go for a walk every day. Let's go biking as a family. Go on family trips where you go through the Grand Canyon and you don't you know, just go on a Disney ride or you don't watch TV and play with games. When you do outdoor activities as part of your life, you maintain it. You are what you are raised to be. So if your parents raise you on being a hiker, you're going to be a hiker. And those people have much less heart disease because they've lived their entire life with being environmentally friendly, exercising, using their two legs, you know, we're a biped. We use our two legs for exercise. Man walked 40,000 steps a day when he was a caveman. We're asking him to do 10,000, but they didn't have cars. They had to walk. To survive, you had to walk. Walking is the best exercise in the world. And I recommend to walk at least an hour a day. There's nothing healthier. What are your thoughts about relaxation techniques to reduce heart disease? Uh, meditation is the greatest thing in the world. And I, I, to be honest, whatever you like, it's good for you. It's the same thing with exercise. Whatever aerobic exercise you like, it's good for you. So if you like Tai Chi, it's wonderful. It's very easy to do. You can do it any age group. I think Tai Chi is tremendous. My wife loves yoga. If I watch you do yoga, I get back pain watching you. So you have to do what you like, but it's very important. And I actually do did this with med students. I would take a Tic Tac pill and I swallowed it. And I said to them, I took a medicine. I want you to tell me what it did to my blood pressure and heart rate and tell me what drug I took. So they take my blood pressure and heart rate. I would take the pill. One of the students would go get a cup of coffee for me or something. And the other three, I'd give the Tic Tacs out and they'd all be laughing. The guy would come back and he'd take my blood pressure. It'd be 20. I could lower my pressure 20 points easily. And I could lower my heart rate 10 to 20 points easily just by meditating. So I'd be meditating for five, 10 minutes. They come back, they check my blood pressure and heart rate and it'd be lower. And then he'd be guessing what drugs I took. And I never took a drug. The fact is relaxation techniques are the best thing to promote a healthier body. And so you should make it part of your lifestyle. My thanks to uh, Dr. Milner for a very informative interview. My thanks to my team at the studio. And my thanks to you, the viewer at home. Let us know how we're doing. You can reach me at my practice website, MontgomeryGastro.com. As for my next guest, it'll be Nathan Barbo, Vice President of Operations at MedStar Montgomery Medical Center. It'll be a fascinating show. See you then next time for another edition of House Call. Good evening. Mm -hmm.